We're looking at Psalm 40 today. For the director of music of David, a psalm. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May all those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. What's the scariest situation you've ever been in? The scariest thing that's ever happened to you? Maybe you can remember a time when you were lost and you couldn't find where you were going. Maybe you were lost without your parents and you couldn't find them. Or maybe you've been really ill and have had to go to hospital or had an injury, an accident, and were scared. Scared at what you might not be able to do, scared at what might happen next. I think one of the times I've been most scared was white water rafting. I don't know if you've been down to Tees Barrage to the, the white water rafting thing. Well, I was on an actual river um, and we were there. There were eight of us, um, seven friends of mine and me in the boat and then one guide who was telling us uh, how to navigate these rapids that we were on. And we were going along through one particular rapid and the next thing I knew, I was in the water. In fact, I was under the water. And I thought we'd capsized. And when you go whitewater rafting, one of the things they do right at the start is they teach you what to do when you've been capsized. When the boat's turned over, there's a bit of an air pocket trapped underneath. And so what you do is you kind of find the air pocket, you take lots of deep breaths, and then you push yourself off and out from under the boat. 
So there I was under the water looking for this air pocket, scrabbling around and I couldn't find it. There was just boats on, on top of me. And I thought, I can't breathe. Where's this air pocket? I don't know, am I gonna drown? And then I popped out behind the boat. Turns out what had happened is that I'd been hit by a large wave and just pushed off the side and got stuck underneath the boat. My seven friends were all in the boat just carrying on with the rapids. <laughs> and then suddenly one of them said, hang on, where's Matthew? And there I was, right back, you know, 10 meters behind them, sort of bobbing around with my life jacket. And they had to go back and pull me into the boat. I was probably only under for about 10 seconds, but it felt a lot longer, I can tell you. I was scared. David's in an even worse situation at the start of this psalm. Look down at verse 2. Look at what he describes. He says he was in a slimy pit. He was in mud and mire. Imagine you're in a pit and you, you're trying to get out, but the, the walls are slimy. You can't get out of this pit. You keep slipping back down. Imagine if you like being stuck at the bottom of a well or stuck in quicksand, sand that sucks you in, mud that you just can't get out of, a mire that you're stuck in. That's the situation David's in. What does he say, well, what does he need in that situation? He needs a rescuer. He needs someone to come and pull him out of the pit, pull him out of the mud. But David here isn't just talking about an actual pit that he'd fallen into. No, he's, this is just a picture of a bigger rescue that he needs. He knows he needs rescuing from sin and from suffering, from all of the things he has done that are wrong, just as we've been hearing from Lindsay, the way that we've said that we want to go our way rather than God's way. David knows that's what he needs rescuing from. And actually, he... He's using a lot of pictures from another story in the Bible that talks about God's people being rescued. Maybe you know the story of the Exodus, where God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. David says, God heard my cry, which is what God said back in the Exodus. He said, I've heard the cry of my people. God set my feet on a rock, he rescued me. That's what the book of Deuteronomy describes God as having done in the Exodus. Then there's a new song in David's mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. What's the first thing the people do when they've gone through the Red Sea, being set free from slavery in Egypt? Miriam leads them in a new song. And many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Well, God, throughout the Exodus, is saying, I'm doing this so that people will know that I'm the Lord. I'm doing this so that people will see and put their trust in me. And in fact, we're, we're coming on to looking at the book of Exodus in September. And one of the things we'll see eventually is that some of the Egyptians actually went out of Egypt with God's people. They'd been kind of adopted into God's people because they'd seen what God had done. And so they trusted in him. Verse 5, many are the wonders you have done. Exactly what was said about the Exodus. So David's kind of getting us to think about these different pictures from the Bible of God saving his people. But of course, there is an even bigger rescue that this is all pointing to that the Exodus pointed forward to, that this psalm points forward to, and that is the rescue of God's people by Jesus. Let me read uh, from Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 7 and onwards, talking about Jesus. It says, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. There in Philippians, we see what Jesus has done in order to rescue his people. Using the picture of this psalm, it's as if Jesus has stepped down into the pit, 
that we find ourselves in. He makes himself nothing. He takes on the, the nature of a human being. He steps down into our sin, our suffering, the mud and mire that we find ourselves in, in order to lift us out, to set us on a rock, to save us, to set us free. That is what Jesus has done for us. He has, verse 2, lifted us out of that slimy pit by getting into it for himself and then lifting us out. So David wants us to know in this psalm, it is God who saves no one else. Now, children, I'm going to say that phrase a number of times during this talk. It's God who saves no one else. So there, I've said it twice already. I want to know how many times I've actually said it, because I'm going to repeat myself quite a bit. So if you're up for counting the number of times I use that phrase and then come up to me at the end and tell me, I'd, I'd quite like to know that. So every time you hear me say it, I've got two already, it's God who saves, no one else. That's three. Keep counting. We'll see how many we get up to at the end. Because that's what this psalm is about. That's what it is saying. And if you're a slightly older child, uh, I'm going to say a couple of things after that phrase that are true because of it. Does that make sense? So whereas that's what the, the psalm is about as a whole, there are some things that we can do as a result. And if you're listening carefully, you'll see what can we do because it's God who saves no one else. Four. Keep counting. Verse four. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Who does not look to the proud. Who does not turn aside to false gods. David's saying, you've got to look to God for blessing, not to the proud. The proud who think that they can save themselves. Imagine me back in that river struggling away. Imagine if I think, oh, you know what? Actually, I'm going to be all right without the guys on the boat. Like, I'm, I'm just going to be fine, you know, drifting down the river by myself. I'll be fine. I can save myself. No. That would be foolish. I needed them to lift me back into the boat. Otherwise, I was stuck. We can't look to other things or things that think that we can save ourselves from the pit that we've got ourselves into. We need a rescuer. Or verse... Um, yeah, the end of verse 4, those who turn aside to false gods. It's God who saves, no one else. False gods won't save us. And as we've said before, false gods don't necessarily mean kind of a, a physical idol or um, another religion. It could just be that you're looking to money or relationships to get yourself out of the hole you found yourself in. But David says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. False gods won't do it. Verse 5, many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done. The things you plan for us, none can compare with you. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. God's so good that even the whole Bible, there's more that could be said. In fact, the end of John's Gospel in the New Testament, John says, Jesus did many other things, and if I were to have written them all down, there wouldn't be room in the world for all of the books I'd have to write. God has done so much more than we can even comprehend. And he has done it for our good, to save us, to lift us up out of that pit. So what's David's response to all of this? That's verses 6 to 10. But first, imagine, imagine getting lost. Like I said at the start, imagine getting lost. Imagine you're a, a, a small child and you're lost in a supermarket. And you're running down the aisles, trying to find your parents, wondering where on earth they've got to. There's lots of scary adults around. 
And I've never actually seen this in a supermarket, but they always kind of happen in cartoons like this. Can you imagine like one of those pyramids of baked bean tins going right the way up to they're about this high and you're a small child like this. And you round the corner looking for your parents and crash, you're into this tower of baked bean tins. And they come tumbling down and you're about to be swamped by a you know, destroyed basically by all of these heavy tins when suddenly your man comes and snatches you away and you are safe. What are you going to do for the rest of that shopping trip? You're going to stay close to her and you're going to listen to her. You don't want that happening again. You're going to stay close to her and you're going to listen to her. And that's exactly what David does with God. He says, sacrifice and offering you didn't desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. He's basically saying, I'm not going to be doing lots of religious stuff to say thank you for saving me. No. Verse 7, I said, here I am. I have come. It's written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. He comes to God and he says, I want to be close to you. I've come. It's written about me in the scroll. That is probably that the Bible tells us about how we can be saved. But it might be that actually he's written down what it is that God has done for him. He's like, look, here's what you've done. This is, this is my story. I'm, I'm coming to you and I'm saying thank you. Here's everything you've done for me, God. And then he says, I desire to do your will. Your law is within my heart. In other words, I want to do what you want now. I want to listen to you and follow you closely. You've done everything for me, so now this is my response. You're going to stay close to God and listen to him. But more than that, David says he wants to tell other people about what God has done. So that's uh, verse 9. He says, I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. He's got all sorts of things that he wants to tell people now that he's been saved. He says, I proclaim your saving acts. Look, Lord, you took me out of that pit and set me on the rock. You did it through Jesus. You, Jesus stepped down and he lifted me up. He put me on the rock. I want to tell people about that. I want to talk about your saving acts. I don't hide your righteousness in my heart. God's righteousness, his rightness, the fact that he is perfect and glorious and good. David says, I want to tell people. I want to speak of your faithfulness, the way that you stay the same, that whatever I do, you are always faithful to your promises to keep me and rescue me. Isn't that incredible? I speak of your faithfulness, your saving help, the way that you are with me in the ups and downs of life. I want to tell you. I want to tell people about it. Isn't it the same for us? We can speak of all that Jesus has done for us. So, well, firstly, we can, we can stay, want to stay close to Jesus and listen to him because of all he has done. Stick close to him, listen to him. That's one of the reasons we gather together, isn't it? To hear from him, to, to be close to him. If it is God who saves no one else, why would we go anywhere else? Why would we go anywhere else? But then also we want to speak of him. We tell each other how good he is and we tell other people. So look, verse 9, David says, I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. The word assembly might remind you of school. Assembly just means gathering. And in the New Testament, that word for assembly or gathering is the word we now use, we now say church. That's what we are. We're the great assembly. Hopefully more interesting than a school assembly. But there we go. You may have great school assemblies. So we're to proclaim what God has done to each other. But then also verse, um, where is it? Verse 3 talks about other people seeing and fearing the Lord and putting their trust in him because of what David's saying. So let's do something of that now.
Um, as, as an aside, wouldn't it be great to hear sometimes stories of what God has done in each other's lives? Maybe that's something that we can talk about over tea and coffee at the end of the service. Maybe we could even do it as part of a Sunday meeting or a, or a Wednesday night prayer meeting, just talking about what God has done in our lives, sharing that with each other. Nothing compares to the promise we have in Jesus. He is so good. So what do we do when things are hard? When we're struggling with sin? When people mock us for following Jesus? When just life is really, really difficult? This next bit shows us that it is God who saves no one else, so we can trust him when it is hard. Look at David in verse 12. Troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. Just look at the situation he is in. Troubles, verse 12, surrounding him. Sins, verse 12, overtaking him. Heart failing within him, depressed people after him, oppressed. David is in the depths. So what does he do? Verse 11. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. God's love and faithfulness. He has just mentioned those. Look up at verse 10, where he says, I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly, from from the church, from God's gathered people. God's love and faithfulness seen in all that he has done for David already, in lifting him from that pit and putting him on the rock. David then says in verse 11, may your love and faithfulness always protect me. He knows God loves him. He knows God is always faithful. And so he prays, Lord, save me again. That's not saying that it's like he's becoming a Christian over again. Like God saved us, then we kind of got out of God's saving hands and then we had to come back and get into them again. No, the Bible says that once we belong to Jesus, nothing will snatch us out of God's hand. He won't let it happen. But we find ourselves in situations where we feel oppressed, we feel the power of our sin still has over us, where we feel we just need, Lord, save us as if it were again. Come and rescue us from this situation, from these sins, from this trouble. Father, we need you again. So it's not we need to have our whole salvation all over again, but it is having been saved ultimately, praying to God, please let me see something of that today as I face this situation, as I battle these sins. It is God who saves no one else, and so we can trust him. When it is hard, when we are facing those things in our lives. I don't know what it is for you, whether it's feeling trapped in sin, that old habit you cannot break, whether it is feeling distant from God, where you feel like he's just, you're not quite sure where he is in your life. Whether it's your health that is just going downhill or the health of those you care for and the situation is just it is beyond words 
in describing how difficult it is in those situations. Because it is God who saves and no one else, we can trust him when it is hard. We can turn to him. It's God who saves, no one else. So we can trust him when he's hard, when it's hard. And what, as we go out from here, what are we called to do? Well, David finishes by calling us to seek the Lord. Verse 16, may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. David calls us to seek the Lord. And what's that mean? Well, if you're here today and you have yet to trust in Jesus to take you out of the pit of your own sin and suffering and lift you onto the rock that is, in fact, him and his life and his death and his resurrection in your place, then seek the Lord by coming to him, coming to Jesus. Let him lift you out of that pit and let him give you the joy. Verse 16, may all who seek you rejoice and be glad. The joy of being part of this gathering, this people that God has called together. Let him lift you out of the pit and bring you into his family. If you're a Christian struggling with sin, seek him, come to him for forgiveness. Forgiveness and help, because his love and faithfulness never end. Nothing you can do can stop them. He will carry on loving you and he will carry on forgiving you. Be glad in him, verse 16, because he will always stoop to save you. He will. If you're here and you find yourself drifting from God, come back, seek him again. He is always ready to welcome us back, however far we've gone, however long it has been. He is always ready to welcome us back. Remember all that he has done, the way that Jesus stooped down into our sin and our sickness and our suffering and even our death in order to bring us out. Just think of him and come back. Think if God gave us Jesus, how will he not give us far more in him? And if you're struggling and life is hard, and that is probably most of us, hold on wait patiently as David prays in the very first verse of this psalm and know that even in the midst of your present darkness because it is God who saves and no one else he can be your rock he can he is your solid ground even when everything else seems to be shaking he will hold you fast We're going to close our time together by singing two songs. Firstly, he will hold me fast. When I fear my faith will fail, this song says, Christ will hold me fast. Look at that, the end of this psalm again. Troubles surrounding David, sins overtaking him, unable to even see. Faith perhaps failing, but Christ will hold us fast even when that is our when that is our experience and then Christ our hope in life and death what is our hope Christ alone it's God who saves no one else